Good afternoon. I'm going to present to you today the conclusions of my fellowship at the University of Exeter. I'll add before we begin that the normal caveats apply here. These are my own views and do not represent those of the University or indeed the Army. Last month, WO2 Barnes stood before you to warn you of the dangers of presentism and neophilia. Uh, you may well be ready to accuse me of having succumbed to these twin temptations, given the topic. Uh, however, I hope to dissuade you of that and demonstrate that biotechnology and particularly performance enhancements represent a qualitatively different challenge to previous instances of chemical enhancement, such as the British use of amphetamines in the Second World War. Given, given the potential of biotechnology, I believe that the Army should declare an intent to research into and set a limit to commit when required to the moderate enhancement of our soldiers. I want to be clear here, I am not suggesting the complete abandonment of drugs policies. Rather, that there is merit in determining how a range of enhancers could have military benefit in controlled circumstances. I'd add that if there is benefit found, that will of course require considerable review of existing personnel policies. Technologists like Ray Kurzweil argue that society is fast approaching the moment of acceleration for technology's exponential growth. And I think the same is probably true of biotechnology today. And like many of the emerging technologies, biotech will change not only how armies fight, but who fights and how they interact with the adversary and the societies that they seek to defend. Across the globe, scientists and governments are exploring ways to use ever-expanding knowledge of the human body and developing technologies to support military activity. And I think it's important to recall that the global, most recent global strategic trends acknowledge enhanced humans, including service personnel, will appear in the operational theatres of tomorrow. Think about how biotechnology may impact on personnel, including the second and third order effects, and how the Army could respond is imperative, I believe, if the Army is to address the type of a dilemma that David Collingridge once described in the 1980s. Shaping the tech development of technology is always difficult. It seldom follows the path of expectation. However, if we wait for full development, it will leave the society and the institution of the army beholden to the decisions of others, principally the technologists, scientists, and early adopters behind the biotech. Today, what I'll lay out for you is the why of cognitive enhancement, some of the how, the implications for the army and society, and finally, a way forward to achieving moderate enhancement. I think before we go any further, though, I should give you some definitions. Forgive me if you're a scientist, I may use these terms slightly sloppier than you are perhaps used to. I do so for expediency and simplicity only. I think the first area we might dwell upon is this idea of performance zones. And within those performance zones, the first one we can consider is treatment or restorative. Restoring someone to their natural baseline of performance is probably the role of medical practitioners. It will likely employ many of the technologies I'm going to expose to you in a moment. But today we're not considering treatment. Instead, we're going to consider how we might take those technologies and techniques and apply them to a person of good health. And that leads me to the second zone, and one that will be familiar to you. Performance optimization, Enabling an individual to achieve the limits of human nature. And it's true that the spectrum of human range of behaviour is pretty vast, as the IQ graph can show you. And I would suggest that if you are able to move someone who is in the left-hand side of that normal range to the right-hand edge, you will have a significant performance improvement, which will be to the benefit of the individual and the institution. And then finally, enhancement. I embrace the notion that enhancement is about going beyond the limits of the normal human range. Now these are quite contentious distinctions and the definitions and the distinctions between them are admittedly blurry. <coughs> we could spend all afternoon discussing them, uh, but we won't. The next thing I think we might consider is the type of enhancer. And I'll make a distinction here between the socially accepted and the not yet socially accepted. And this distinction favours a judgement based upon familiarity and public perception. Society's relationship with drugs is perhaps illustrative of the way that enhancers can fall in and out of fashion, or indeed smoking for that matter. It highlights the fact that what may seem unusual or unacceptable today is probably nothing that we can't get used to tomorrow. And I believe a case can be made that optimization and enhancement 
can be achieved through both social, socially accepted, and not yet socially accepted types of enhancer. And finally, cognitive performance. This is a range of brain functions I'm wrapping up here, from working long-term memory, attentiveness, executive functions such as decision-making or problem-solving. And I think it's important to acknowledge that soldiering, even today, places a significant burden on all of these functions. By way of illustration, I suggest you, we take, for example, the room clearance. Um, Blackler et al. described that individuals engaged on a room clearance are in relying heavily on their visual and auditory perception to see and hear inputs. Their deployment of the visual spatial attention is key, as the entire relevant area must be observed. If a hostile target is identified, the individual is deciding on a course of action and then executing the necessary motor response, all accompanied by knowledge that is learned during training, such as what, individ what order individuals are entering the room, what individuals are responsible for. And whilst all this is going on, they are compounded by additional distractions, or psychological and physiological stresses. That is today, add in artificial intelligence and a range of sensors, and the pressure on the human brain is only likely to increase. And I think before we go further, I want to declare some assumptions here. First, that the UK re remains committed to upholding international law. Second, the public remain interested in what happens to their boys and girls and how we treat them. Third, that soldiering, partly because of the danger, dirt and dullness it occasions, forms an important part of a soldier's identity and the opportunity for individual growth. And fourth, that we are concerned with the army adopting technologies and techniques of enhancement ahead of the rest of society. A quick word on history and the law. International law is, unsurprisingly given its date of drafting, largely silent on the status of enhancements and enhanced personnel. We can apply some contortions to international law to classify enhanced soldiers as a weapon, uh, but they are beyond the scope of today. Domestic law clearly covers the supply of controlled drugs, but there's little to say about brain stimulation devices or brain computer interfaces beyond the normal concerns of health and safety and good medical ethics and scientific practice. History too is rich in lessons of chemical enhancement. I already mentioned Britain's sizable use of amphetamines in the Second World War, but also it's quite clear that our, our allies have extensive practice. Um, from all of this historical lessons, I point to I think, two concerns today. One, for the welfare of personnel, and two, for the controlled use. But the final word from history, I'm going to reserve for Socrates and, and his story of Tamu. This story provides a useful reminder that those invested in the development of technology, either as a creator or an advocate, are seldom the best to judge the impact on society. And that's why I think it's important that we begin to engage with these topics, as potentially uh, frightening as they may seem. So why enhance? I, I think there are numerous reasons that could be used to justify enhancement soldiers. Some are compelling, others less so. I, I'm going to dwell upon three of them, I think, for today. The first is keeping up. The USA has a long history of using pharmaceuticals to aid performance, particularly in its air crews. However, it's pretty clear that parts of the US Army are considering far more radical types of enhancement. Several of their sponsored research papers have su suggested that by 2050, the battlefield will be entirely populated by the enhanced soldiers. Some, perhaps more cyborg than human. The unenhanced, simply a force of last resort. Australia has begun considering how technology can best be placed in the soldier and not merely on her. And with allies making themselves more alert, more decisive, or simply faster and stronger, there is potential, I'd suggest, for a performance gap to open between the enhanced and the unenhanced. It may be that to remain interoperable, enhancements become a necessity. And competitors are equally, equally active in this area. The Chinese have written how they believe neuroscience must be considered as a way of war. They believe, such as the potential, that the one who leads and dominates the field will achieve success in wars. And this leads me, I think, to the second justification, force protection. It may be that the UK loses the luxury of choosing what to fight with when others use enhancers. Soldiering already generates demands that outstrip what humans achieve naturally. And I think if adversaries are using enhancements, that pressure will only increase. And reputation of the force may suffer if harm occurs 
as a failure of a result to provide enhancements which are known to be safe and effective. I can envisage a point where negative reporting about a failure to provide enhancements akin to that uh, seen a few years ago in regards to armoured vehicles occurs. And I think finally it's important to note that our technology has moved the tempo of conflict beyond the organic battle rhythm that used to provide a degree of respite to our soldiers. How armies choose to fight and what they fight with risks making us, the human, the weakest link in defence. If we are to maintain human and loop requirements for artificial intelligence and autonomous systems, they will forever be beholden to our abilities. Upgrading the human could make our preferred ways of fighting more achievable and the weapons available to us more effective. As Norbert Wiener wrote in the 1950s, we have modified our environment so radically that we must now modify ourselves to exist in that new environment. Whilst I don't advocate us all becoming experts in the various methods of enhancement, it's important that those charged with making decisions actually understand what they are and how they work. In this spirit, I'm going to take you through three ways of enhancing performance, cognitive performance. And they range from that which is readily available on the shelf today to that which is far more developmental. And they sit within a much broader portfolio of techniques that Martin Dressler has identified. I suggest the army is already engaged in some forms of cognitive enhancement. Um, and we may well ask, like Julian Savalescu does, uh, a prominent writer from Oxford in this area, what actually is the difference between a pill and a good cup of, good cup of tea? Or indeed, the ubiquitous coffee cups, which I see around the army headquarters and other formations every time. I'll acknowledge that conspicuous in its absence from the dresser's list is gene editing, particularly something like CRISPR-Cas9. Um, all I'll say on gene editing today is that memory improvements have been found in experimentation, but often at the expense of other types of brain function. And the Chinese CRISPR twins is a tale of dubious research ethics and unclear results at best. But what it, this does indicate is that researchers, often sponsored by states, are beginning to explore what gene editing can do for performance and particularly military performance. Today, though, I want to focus on pharmacology, brain stimulation, and computer interfaces. Pharmacology is of obvious interest following last year's Future Land Action Seminar, but that should not be the sole limit of our horizon. Other technologies and techniques are available, and we should be considering them. Singer and Cole's ghost fleet suggests a near future in which everyone is using stimulants. And by 2050, I've already mentioned that the US predict ubiquitous enhancement on the battlefield. What I won't do is dive deep into the science of these technologies, but I'll outline what they do and, and some of the potential known concerns. Stimulants have a long history, and when it comes to cognitive performance, the last decade has witnessed a flurry of interest in so-called study drugs. These drugs, modafinil, a narcolepsy drug, and Adderall and Ritalin, a class B amphetamines used to treat ADHD. <coughs> Despite all being controlled, they are readily available today via the internet and indeed on university campuses. And studies suggest that between 3 to 20% of the population are using these stimulants already today to enhance their performance. And whilst we don't know what their use is within the military, a study from the Americans a few years back found that 10% of their response within the military were using a form of stimulant, but I'd note that many said it was for health reasons rather than performance enhancement. But people are using stimulants, and I suspect they're already active within the military at some places. Of the three, modafinil and Ritalin and Adderall, modafinil is the drug of choice, I'd suggest. It aids planning skills, accuracy of decision making, and increases the levels of alertness. I think we can make a case for modafinil both on patrol and in the observatory. However, it does come with side effects. It may be disadvantageous. Users seem to become overly confident in their abilities. It takes longer than a control group to make a decision, and users become less creative. There are a raft of other pharmaceuticals that we might also consider. Beta blockers have been shown to be effective at reducing the level of emotion connected to a memory. They could well provide a means of preventing the onset of PTSD. And then there is a growing community of microdosers. They use minuscule amounts of drugs such as LSD or mushrooms in order, in their words, to feel themselves but better. Uh, one US Marine Corps officer has suggested that microdosing might have utility for the military intelligence community. For the second category of brain stimulation, 
it's equally old. The Emperor Claudius' doctor used to prescribe an electric eel for the, to, to treat a headache. Essentially, brain stimulation requires an electrical field or a magnetic, electrical current or magnetic field to be applied to the brain in order to change brain function. Contemporary electrical stimulation requires very small uh, current, typically one to two milliampers. And for the budding home user, there is a raft of advice on the internet out there as to how to either build your own stimulation device in your garage or simply to buy one off the shelf through the various suppliers which are out there. They function by essentially altering the levels of brain plasticity, the production of brain cells and the neural connections for a short period of time. And whilst these are active, they enable us to learn and train better and recall uh, at a later date what, what we've learned. Davis and Smith's overview of brain stimulation devices suggest that they could have use both in training and in operations from learning quicker to better memory recall to target identification. However, before you rush out to find a 9 volt battery, I'd suggest it's worth noting some of the concerns. Notably, many researchers in this field are not actually convinced that stimulation has an enhancement use. Others point to the fact that studies do not investigate what happens to other parts of the brain when we're busy stimulating one aspect. The, the current has to travel somewhere after all. And it's clear that everyone's brain is different and that stimulation to be truly effective needs to be appropriately tailored to the individual. And I think that this might diminish the utility of stimulation in many military settings as finance and time costs are increased. And in a nod to a theme that I'll return to later, parents have expressed concern about the impact on character development when asked if they would consider uh, stimulating their children's brains with electricity. And finally, brain-computer interfaces. Many would argue that these could be revolutionary for command and control and their use of remote systems. In essence, they work by detecting and responding to changes and patterns in brainwaves. A potential use is of a pilot communicating with a computer through brainwaves that allows not only connection to a series to a swarm of remote <coughs> drones, but also communication and flow of an analysed information between computer and pilot. If done properly, it could present a significant step towards achieving human-machine blending. Alternatively, we could also use interfaces to create a brain net between staff, with everyone able to communicate silently and remotely. We could improve the analytical capacity and increase the situational awareness of headquarters. And functioning brain computers already exist, often connected to treatment. And there's growing interest from the big tech sector here. Elon Musk's Neuralink is evidence of this. And helpfully, Elon Musk's experiment reveals one major I think, stumbling block that we have with the most effective forms of computer interfaces. They require invasive brain surgery to be truly effective. Others are experimenting with external devices, it's true. However, those early trials have shown to be far less effective. But were an external, removable device de be developed to achieve the same levels of capability as an invasive device, I think many of the most challenging ethical issues would be removed. That's not to say that there wouldn't be any. I think there would be concerns of both cognitive liberty and privacy within the use of brain interfaces. So three ways to enhance brain function, all at varying stages of development, or with a variety of risks. And as the categorization of harms on the screen shows, I think some of these can be addressed through purely scientific research, others require far broader discussion. I'm going to focus on, again on three of them for the moment. And I would note that the discussion of military human enhancement needs to be seen as part of a much broader debate across society about the, the, issue, about the issue of human enhancement and around. And it's clear that many in society, perhaps some of you in this room, are likely to suffer moral vertigo at the prospect of, of what I'm suggesting. Um, because we are unable to allow our, our morality to keep up with the pace of technology. Preventing the onset of moral vertigo requires early engagement with the profound concerns of the, that the enhancement raises, that do strike to the heart of what it means to be human, to be a soldier, and ask us to consider whether soldiers are properly a part of society or should simply be a part from society. To start, I, I'd like to consider the idea that enhancement is to the detriment of character and virtue. Militaries clearly hold both in high regard. General Hackett famously observed that a man of bad character could never be a good soldier. Enhancements, some argue, are to the detriment of both as they shortcut the effort required. It's worth unpacking why. 
Being virtuous for Aristotle meant being able to respond to the right person in the right amount, at the right time, with the right aim, and in the right way. In other words, the virtuous individual knows why they act and can modify their responses accordingly. Enhancements that make a soldier, for example, feel courageous, and I think here of ISIS's use of captagon, do not result in the genuine display of the virtue of courage. And character development, many would argue, requires a degree of struggling and striving, and the highs and lows of military experience. Enhancements, some fear, will rob soldiers of the need to strive or experience the lows of their profession. And as a result, character and virtue will diminish. Perhaps to the point where any pride that comes from wearing a uniform disappears and a soldier simply becomes a mere technician of violence. I think there is a risk of overplaying the effects of some enhancements. Many do not simply deliver a matrix-like knowledge dump to the individual. Instead, they might actually provide a way for an enhancement in way for an individual to be more engaged in their task. Possibly, enhanced individuals are capable of being more virtuous than the unenhanced. And I suspect there's few who would argue that the amphetamine-enhanced soldiers, sailors and airmen of the Second World War were lacking in character or virtue. I suggest that resolving this issue comes from ensuring that enhancements are used for the right reason, not simply to plug gaps or offset failures elsewhere. Nor should enhancement come at the ability to respond to the context or at the expense of the internal goods that flow from being a soldier, the sense of camaraderie, confidence, history, for instance. Which leads me on to the idea of what are the impact on civil military relations. It's one thing to gain an ad advantage against an adversary, quite another to do so against a society that an army is meant to defend. Using any form of enhancement will require an assessment of the freedoms an individual should it have while still under its effect. For instance, a soldier issued modafinil for an exercise could have an advantage in a subsequent academic exam, if you like, against their civilian peers were they to, to take it while still under its effects. The, and the issues of freedom become ever more challenging when invasive and therefore likely permanent brain computer interfaces are considered. With military technology embedded in the soldier, the soldier really ought to expect their movements to be restricted. After all, we don't allow soldiers to move weapons and other equipment around freely. Post-service, the army would face a choice, remove the device, perhaps to the harm of the soldier, or restrict their, their ability to ever really leave service. And as freedoms are reduced, the interaction between soldier and society will change. And the first casualty will be the ability of civilians to connect to what our soldiers do. The lack of familiarity between soldier and society is already quite high. Enhancements will make the distance even greater. And the average civilian will no more be able to relate to the actions of the enhanced soldier than they will imagine themselves flying like a bird. And as the gap between enhanced and society grows, it may well lead to our identities changing. At the moment, soldiers enjoy both civilian and military ident identities. One may be stronger than the other, but they are there, along with other identities. Substantial forms of enhancement could erode our civilian identities and lead simply to the creation of a forever soldier identity. And with this new identity, this singular identity, it becomes possible to foretell the instrumentalisation of soldiers as the relationship between soldier and state begins to alter. Forever soldiers may make wars easier to contemplate for governments because, at the end of the day, who will really care what happens to the enhanced? And finally, there's a need to address the issue and status of consent. The requirement for individuals to provide informed consent is well enshrined in bioethics and military medicine. However, the potential benefits of enhancement should lead us to question whether it should still be so well protected. There are those that simply recommend that enhancement to our morality should be obligatory. Enhancing the ability to make more moral decisions is actually appealing as it could increase the likelihood of protecting third parties. Protecting them and those under command should lead us to question whether commanders and other roles should be subject to compulsory enhancement. The answer for the moment in English law is probably no but only because the evidence for efficaciousness and safety isn't there. That, though, doesn't stop organisations encouraging their staff to enhance. I point to the Queensland Health Authority several years ago that encouraged their staff to drink more coffee, simply, it seems, because modafinil was more expensive as a surgeon. And consent is equally threatened by internal circumstance. Pressure to enhance in an era of forever soldiers will occur when people believe others derive some benefit from enhancement whether through greater prospects for promotion or a belief that refusal to enhance would be regarded negatively. 
and the evidence from student populations and the military in the Second World War shows that people do not engage in truly informed decisions in this area. I think we should expect the same. The final reason to question the status of consent is in regard to the reason that enhancements are being offered in the first place to improve performance and force protection. If they are seen as necessary, then I think one might ask why individuals should be given the freedom to choose in the first place. Many questions need to be addressed. Two I think we might usefully answer here today. First, how far should the army consider enhancing soldiers? And secondly, what might be the control system? Addressing the first, I believe that the horizon for enhancement should be set at moderate enhancement. It's a fuzzy area between optimisation and enhancement. This preserves the fundamentally important human aspects of being a soldier. Soldiers may well be, as Michael Walter would have it, a class apart from society, but that doesn't mean that they should become radically different from the society that they protect. Moderate enhancement also requires soldiers not to be subject to enhancements and impose post-service harms, or otherwise humiliate or restrict their liberty. And of the three methods covered today, I suggest that invasive computer interfaces are therefore dismissed. Pharmacology and brain stimulation, though, could have utility. Of course, committing to moderate enhancement does not prevent the ongoing study into other forms of radical enhancement, principally as a defensive measure when adversaries use them, and most definitely ought not to be at the expense of the mundane, Eating, training and sleeping well is a significant part of cognitive performance and one we often forget. And for many of our soldiers, that triad ought to be enough to attain the levels of cognitive performance that are routinely required of them. And I think even if moderate enhancement provides a degree to which the army considers it enhancement, it's necessary to develop a robust control framework that guides commanders in determining what types of enhancers should be used. Lawrence and Carlyle, I believe, are the most compelling framework. Compelling because it's holistic and it borrows from a concept that's familiar to us all. Just enhancement theory leans heavily on just war theory. The first requirement they set out, just cause, points to the need for there to be a morally acceptable justification for enhancement, as I mentioned earlier. And I think we find that within force protection reasons. Identifying the costs of enhancement leads to the second criteria of proportionality. It ought to be expected that the benefits of enhancement outweigh the associated cost to user, army and society. I, I won't labour the point here, but context will be crucial in determining where that balance is to be found. And the third, the third criteria that they set out builds upon one of my initial assumptions. Respect for the law, and international law particularly, matters. Enhancements ought not to lead to the compromising the soldier's ability to do the right thing, or provide the means for a state to do the wrong thing. Finally, transparency or publicity affords the means to hold decision makers to account, while simultaneously providing the opportunity to engage numerous stakeholders in making the case for a particular enhancement. Use of enhancement focuses attention on how enhancement is to be implemented and the specifics of how it's to be used. The issue of consent needs further work, as I've mentioned already. However, if consent were to be abandoned, I suggest that the principles of proportionality and just cause, combined with respect for the duty of care to those under our command, will need to be reinforced. I'll make two further observations. First, on the issue of authority, I suggest an approach that brings together commanders and the medical, and the medical chain to provide advice to determine when enhancer ought to be used. And I think we could borrow heavily here from the rules of engagement process and targeting to ensure that the interests or those affected by enhancement are considered. Ensuring that soldiers do not begin to conflate their enhanced self with their real self is also equally important. And this requires not only consideration of the enhanced effect, but the setting in which we apply. I think what this requires is a controlled system of use and the screening of soldiers to find suitable candidates. And effectively it requires the creation of enhancement scripts that describe the who, the how and the why of any particular enhancer. And finally, use post-enhancement requires one to consider the consequences of an enhancement and what it may mean for the individual, institution and society. To conclude, I suggest that conflict for the foreseeable future is likely to require the human to contribute. But that human, our soldiers, will be subject to a variety of ever-increasing pressures. And ensuring that the human is capable of functioning and surviving means the British Army should research 
and perhaps commit to a programme of moderate enhancement of its personnel. I've set out to you today a framework for the control system for moderate enhancement. But achieving this requires additional research. Safety and efficaciousness of the enhancers are self-evident requirements and it's much to be done there. Because simply put, soldiers ought not to be subject to enhancers that are dangerous or do not provide a benefit that can be not, can, cannot be found through other techniques. The issue of consent requires us to understand the ability of it now. Mixed, enhanced and unenhanced teams to operate and function effectively together. We need to understand what the impact is on operating mixed, enhanced, unenhanced teams in order to decide what the future of consent is. An important and missing voice, I think, in this area is that of the actual soldier that we're going to ask to take these enhancers. I, I note, I sit... I give this lecture at Army Headquarters to a room full of staff. It would be useful to understand what our soldiers make of this. And finally, even moderate enhancements begins to lead to the accusation of the weaponisation of military medicine. And that will have implications that need to be better understood. I think even if you disagree with my suggestion that we pursue moderate enhancement, what is truly important, I believe, is that you're beginning to engage with the issue of human enhancement and how it will impact upon the army. Because it, it's a question of when, not simply if. Better that we start this engagement now than stumbling into a rushed decision at some point in the near future when either our allies or adversaries decide to use performance enhancements. Ladies and gentlemen, the end. <laughs>